So, Todd McGowan, thanks very much once again for joining us on Hermetics. Oh, podcast. James, great to great to be with you. Uh, so we are very loosely discussing a book which someone mentioned to me, and they said you, you're you're going to find this interesting. Uh, the end of dissatisfaction? Question mark. Jacques Lacan and the Emerging Society of Enjoyment, which is uh, published in two thousand and three. Um, and I messaged you about this. Said, do you want to talk about the book? And you sort of said, happy to, but you know, sort of. Uh, it's, uh, you, as you described it, an old relic of a book, which, you know, I think is quite a nice, nice way. Um, it's a really, really interesting book. And, I'm, you know, when I was taking my notes and putting down the questions, halfway through, I already had too many. Um, <laughs> there's, there's just so much here to, there's so much here to, to go into. But, I mean, one thing I'll open it up with, which is a huge question and a huge interest of mine is yeah. uh, a reliance uh, in the beginning of this and maybe with all of this sort of stuff, enjoyment, pleasure, desire, um, uh, a tendency for us to use this word modernity right we go yeah. ah, it's modern it's, it's modern it's modernity yeah. do you think that's a thing do you think modernity is is a a thing absolutely absolutely yeah i i i, I use that term all the time and i think it's uh i think there i think it's one of those like maybe it's the this is an exaggeration, but maybe it's the only historical event, right? Like maybe it's like the fund. I, I would say, like, I think the notion that just the idea that, that subjectivity is the starting point for thought. So this the Cartesian move away from like, taking God as the starting point for thought and making it subjectivity. And then the notion that like, Sapore ade, that like that that idea from Kant, like you know, emancipate yourselves from your minority, like this this minority status. Like I, I feel like that's, you know, that that that's an epochal event. Yeah, I I I I absolutely believe in that that in the idea of modernity. Yeah. So it seems like uh, sorry to overcomplicate things, but it seems like modernity for you is uh, perhaps a little bit gnostic. That history begins after we've we've eaten of the eaten of the fruit that we shouldn't have eaten of yeah yeah i think that's right i mean i think that i think that the the notion of the fortunate fall is a is that i i, I like that idea the fortune yeah. the fortunate fall fortunate i haven't, fall. Had, I haven't, yeah, I haven't yeah. heard of this yeah yeah so like, like i think that's the i think that's even you know implicit in milton like I think that the notion that the fall is in some way emancipatory, like that's the, like the eating of the app, like that the eating of the of the fruit, like that that there's something that that's the emancipatory gesture, which is I think aligned with modernity. I think that's right. So emancipatory in the sense that that discovery might lead us back to an objective truth, which we then discover for ourselves, or emancipatory in the sense that our desires are really the basis for for meaning and purpose in the world second yeah the second that 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 we are that 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 alienation like at fortune fall in this sense that alienation is not something to be lamented and overcome but something to be to see as what's constitutive of our existence right so 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 then our like you said our, our desire our our structure of fantasy like that's that actually forms the world that we exist in. So I think that only becomes evident in modernity. So I think that's really, so I think that's why for me, modernity really has an important, and I, I understand all the, the terrible things associated with it too. Like, I think that, I think that, that that emancipatory moment also is the moment when racism basically begins. Right. So I think that, I think that there's all these, there's also this, whole underside to modernity that comes along with it but I, I i think that that if you don't have that then you're just stuck in tradition and i think that's a really to me that's what we're emancipated from is tradition like i think that's all i think every emancipatory project is an emancipation from tradition so in what I'm, I'm quite interested in what sense does modernity sort of then open the way this this fortunate fall open the way for racism is, is that at some point in history do you see that as being prohibited well, I just think it didn't, it wasn't even a, the, I think that the, 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 the opening of, of equality that happens in modernity, then racism is a reaction against that. So, right, like, so, so once there is this possibility of universal equality, then there's racism as the 
like, oh, that's horrifying. And let's try to find a way out of that. But I, prior to modernity, there's no, there's no, I, there's no notion of equality, oh, right? I see what you mean. Okay, so that that release of from tradition, which itself is prohibitive, opens up into the potential for equality, which then yeah. itself basically says, well, now racism is prohibited. So do you think that then, because of that, people are then desire ra- desire to be racist because that's the prohibition of the modern world well yeah i mean that i think that's part of it but i also think there's just something horrible about equality right like there's something it's traumatic it's i mean it's traumatic and i think because because if you if you accept universal equality then your identity doesn't it ceases to provide this assurance that okay i'm this thing Mm. and racism allows you to believe like oh i am this that my identity really is something that differentiates me from everyone else and i think that that's or from other groups whatever Mm. so i think that that's that's to me why it why it forms uh is that what would you would you say that's why all in all intolerance forms all prejudice, yeah, all kind of, all, all discriminatory moves, yeah. I think that they're all responses to this, at least in the modern world. I think in the, in the in pre-modern world, I think it's different. Like, I think in the modern world, it's it's precisely this, I'm, it's a it's a reaction against universal equality, like that, that, that and, the, and, the, and the trauma of that. Okay, okay. But there's this, there's, there's, really strange double bind then i mean it's good that we have we have modernity and i think we're both agreed on however difficult that thing is to uh outline there is yeah. a I'm, I'm dare i say it, and i'm not a hegelian but there's a spirit to modernity which is clear but you can't exactly yeah. articulate it yeah. but there is a strangeness to it in that it's sort of it's teleology which doesn't have an end is that it's release of all prohibitions basically right. do what you want but right. the problem is that, as you as you outline in the book, that sort of um, classical psychoanalysis would form that a lot of desire comes from there being a prohibition. If you say to someone you can't do this, then all of a sudden there's this instinct, dare I say, instinctive, oh, actually, now I want to do it. So what happens with, and I mean, really, I think this is the underlying thesis of the book, in a way, what happens when the the entire modus operandi of, the, of society, of, of modernity is do we want do you know when we're not holding anything back in terms of desire in terms of wants and needs i mean what happens to desire in that sense yeah i think it seeks out other ways to to you know i think it, it, it it's suffocated right like so i think it seeks out other obstacles and that's i think what what happened. like i think that that without and i think this we see this in the way this like total absence of any prohibition like you you find this erection of different kinds of obstacles that get in the way i think that's what we see happening all the time around us so i i that's what i would say like if the if the if the structure itself the social structure itself doesn't create inherent obstacles then i think we just erect them we find ways to erect them okay that's what i was going to say i mean maybe i'll put this this theory forward and see if if you then agree with it. I mean, in a, in in modernity, in a society that says as much sexual freedom as you want, as much, and and I guess we'd have to add in that, that some of this is to do with capitalism as well and individualism. Yeah. But as much sure. gluttony as you want, as you know, eat what you want, do what you want, watch what you want, consume what you want. That would you say that actually this this new um, rise in especially young people returning to traditions you know capital t traditions of the church of more strict monotheistic religions do you see that as them erecting as you say prohibitions to give themselves value and meaning absolutely absolutely but i think it's even evident among the the groups that are sort of ensconced in the liberal like do what you want right because so the example the conservative like more fundamentalist people you're talking about for sure that's working but mm-hmm. i think it's operative you know i teach at a university where there's like the students come to me and they come to my officer and say i feel such a prohibition on what i can say right like there's like there's not it's it's like okay a lot of things are like you're you're free to say anything sexually but there's a whole other limit like like you're allowed to, in casual conversations, say "fuck." There's no prohibition mm. on it at all, mm. right? On certain, on 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 profane language to do with like the body and sex, but to say something about, uh, you know, uh, uh, other there's certain other words that I'm not even going to say which are prohibited, 
which 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 are not to do with like sexuality or whatever but they're but they're to do with maybe identity or questions like that and they're there and so it's just like i don't even it's not that i want to say the certain words it's that i feel like if i even go into that talk about that i'm gonna step on i'm gonna say the wrong thing and then it's gonna be a catastrophe so i think that there is this sense of like real prohibit like like the erection of all these pro like even among the people that are ensconced in the liberal like do what you mm-hmm. want there's still a real sense of i think today more than maybe ever of like serious limitations on what you can say okay okay maybe maybe i'll um I'll take the bait and I ask you maybe for uh, if you could think of one a lesser example of I mean you know I'd forward this with saying that we're taking this in complete context of this is something you can't say but what what is an example that perhaps your students is something you might consistently be seeing at the moment as many many students feel they can't broach that subject well like like okay like so like the use of the word they as a as a a term for someone singular right Mm -hmm. like that like to say that you a student has come to me and said like i i don't i i'm worried because i'm not sure if i'm going to say it the correct way or what the what the even what the proper verb is to mm-hmm. use with they and i feel like if i screw that up then i'm going to i'm going to i'll be like i'll have i'll feel like the so certain collective wrath brought down upon me so that's a so that you know, like is it they are is it they is i don't know is that so that seems like a kind of a innocent example, but it's, but I think this, this student that came to me didn't feel like it was innocent. They felt, they felt like they're, they're all they were saying. I mean, they weren't necessarily complaining. They were just saying, I feel this pressure that I have to do say the, the thing correctly. And I'm not sure exactly how to do it. And I just th- found it fascinating that here's this like totally, op- you know, everything, you know, like all, everything's allowed. You can say whatever, but, there's all these kinds of strictures on what you can say. And what's even more, it's interesting, it reminds me of this joke that Slavoj Žižek likes to tell about under Stalinism, when he said under Stalin, it was prohibited to, to criticize Stalin, but it was even more prohibited to say that it's prohibited to criticize <laughs> Stalin, right? So that's how it is today. Okay. Like it's prohibited to say certain things, but it's even more prohibited to say that it's prohibited to say certain things, right? Mm. So so that or to say what those things are so so i find that really really interesting because it's this seeming like you can do whatever you want you can say whatever but but there's actually all kinds of restrictions so i think that i think that you know in a way this is why i feel like you asked me why you know i need to talk about this book and <laughs> is it a relic and this is one reason why i kind of think it's a relic because i think that i didn't fully grasp the way in which prohibitions actually get erected out of this you can do whatever you want you know like i think that i just thought well this pressure to enjoy this pressure to do whatever you want do what you desire i didn't see how people just won't they just react against it and just erect new prohibitions even if it's in this total you know attitude of freedom do what you want i mean yeah i mean in a strange way that actually leads us back to the sort of the religious analogy that we're using at the start is the great irony of being a human really is someone says which is really the, the promise of of capitalistic modernity is here's eden you can do whatever you want you can you can say whatever you want right uh you can eat whatever you want blah 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 blah, blah. and the first thing humans do is go i wonder what i can't do Right, right. Right. So maybe, so do you think that in a way that these prohibitions then, you know, the ones that we were just talking about, the fact that we we don't really seem to know now where they're, they're from, not like these sort of classical prohibitions. Do you think that, as you say, that, that this inability to step into that zone or even to talk about the fact you can't, as in the case of the Zizek joke, that's, is that individually made, individually created? I don't think so. I think it's part, I think it's collective. Like, I think it's, these are all, I think, operations of the way in which the social order function. I mean, not officially, right. But like collective actions through what I know we could call it like the big other or what Heidegger calls the they, right. Like, I think, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a liberal individual. I think it's just a a very much a collective organized, it's not organized, it's disorganized, but it's a, it's a collective action, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, I'd like to link this into one of the, the, the another sort of deep irony of of that of that Eden, which we are all apparently 
agree on. We all apparently agree that things are getting better, that we have access to all these uh, de-restrictions and everything's open and et cetera, et cetera, and everything's sort of emancipated. Uh, in terms of, you know, in, in the book, in terms of enjoyment, pleasure, leisure, these are the things that we've targeted ourselves towards in a, in a, in a way that's obvious to us. And there's an underlying sort of agreement that, especially around Christmas time, that we're all, uh, we're all happy, right? we're enjoying yeah. ourselves. But you, and I, I would agree, uh, state, really, no one is. Um, right. We right. are entering into enjoyment, but we're not enjoying enjoyment. Right. I think that, to me, the key thing is the way that, in, it, like, when enjoyment is an imperative, then I think it's impossible to enjoy, right? Like, to, right. I, my favorite example of this, because I'm a total insomniac, is... If I tell myself, and I, like, I have to get to sleep tonight, I didn't sleep last night, I've got to sleep, it's then it's just hopeless, right? Mm. It's only when I'm like, whatever, I don't care, I can sleep or not, it'll be, and then I just, I'm out, right? Like, I think enjoyment is exactly like that, right? Mm. Like, when you feel this pressure to enjoy, your, you're always, like, looking around, like, am I really enjoying myself enough? I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure everyone's been at a, hopefully, has been at a party where, you're looking around going like, I don't feel like I, everyone else looks like they're enjoying themselves. I know that I'm not. I clearly am missing out on something. What? How can I get in on what everybody else has? And I think that that's, I don't know, like I remember when I was in high school and I hadn't had sex, I would look at people that I knew had had sex and I'd be like, wow, they're like a different species. <laughs> like that's what I thought. Oh, yeah, like, for they're, sure, for sure. they're just a different species. Like they have this access to some kind of enjoyment that they've had that I just have never had. And so I think that that to me is the real thing. Like the more that you feel the pressure, the more you feel you're missing it, mm -hmm. what everybody else is getting. And it's, and it's mad because outside of the actual experience of that thing, I mean, to take sex as an example, to then have it and then say to people who are, who are, you look back and you see someone who's also having that worry that you used to have and you sort of say, it's good, but just don't put this pressure on yourself. They right. will never, they'll never be like, oh, okay, right? Because it's there's like a there's like a leap where it's that's like that's right, that's right. That's and right. so what what it, it never I mean, works, right. right? Psychoanalytically speaking, what is that? What would that that leap be? You know, well, it's leap a leap of extreme. fantasy, right? Like, like, like they're so like you can never. I think this is a real important psychoanalytic idea that you can never talk someone out of their fantasy <laughs> because so, so like you can tell them till, till the cows come home that sex is fine it's good it's it's nice but it's not like it's not life altering yeah, it's, it's not what it's not what you've made it's not gonna right. yeah does it matter right like it's just like it's just like the way that people have a certain fantasy about like the vaccine will magnetize you right like, like you can tell them like look no uh look, all these doctors and experts have said that there's no magnetic qualities to the vac. Like, it doesn't matter because they're, they have a phantasmatic investment in that idea. And so that, and it's because the fantasy provides enjoyment. And so if you don't, the, the knowledge that you give them is not going to offset that enjoyment that the fantasy mm. provides. I mean, it's, Freud says this interesting thing in this little essay, it's a great little essay called Wild Psychoanalysis, where he says, the point is you can never, can never cure someone with information. You can't go outside and say like, what well, I found out actually your father didn't sexually abuse you. It's okay. Like that doesn't, mm, mm. It doesn't matter because the, and I think this is real, such an important idea that the, the, the lack of knowledge isn't the cause of the disorder. The disorder is the cause of the lack of knowledge. So like, it'd be like in, in America, we have this channel, I'm sure you've heard of it called Fox news, right? And the people <laughs> that people that watch Fox news are, are the most, uninformed political beings, right? Like they're just mm -hmm. empirically, they're less informed. And people and everyone on, on the left or liberal left criticizes, well, if they just didn't watch Fox News, they could be more informed. And if they watched whatever, MSNBC, CNN, they'd be more informed. But no, they're watching Fox News. They're not being informed because they already have the fantasy structure and then they get it. Con so the, the lack of knowledge comes afterward. And I think that's why in this example of the sexual thing, that's why they that lack of knowledge of what sex really is like that's all re that's a result of a certain mm -hmm. fantasy way of relating to sexuality, and so knowledge is not going to cure it. Mm -hmm. 
So really in that in that case of uh, the person who's built this fantasy, someone else explaining to them, look, your fantasy is not, it's just a fantasy. That's just going to bolster their it's fantasy. Gonna, you know, they're exactly. going to think, no, this person's, this person's lying to me. It is well, good. Well, right, exactly, James. Like they're going to say like, look, they, they're saying that, but that, they can only say that because it's so amazing that for the, <laughs> like, you know, that they can't, yeah. can't even be put into words, right? Like that's what you, that's mm. what I would say to myself in a similar mm. situation. Or in that, I even remember saying my, that to myself. Yeah, actually. I mean, yeah, if it was only just good, like you said, then why would you even bother bringing it up? Right, right, right. right. right, right okay, right. so that, I mean, that, that begs a huge question though. I mean, and uh, I'll bring in my favorite, probably my favorite philosophical quote ever because i just remember thinking it's so ridiculous actually i'll i'll bring it in now it's from uh, i think you you mention it or you at least cite Lyotard in the book uh from libidinal economy yeah you know the famous hold on tight and spit on me the workers yeah. desire their misery basically to paraphrase it yeah. um they you know the, the i mean it, there was always this deep sort of chasm between the, the very in a way aristocratic Lyotard John Francois Lyotard, you know, the academic who gets to sit there and and stroke stroke his chin about the workers who are in the factory. You know, there's a big right. distance, but you know that whole idea of that they are desiring their misery, and we're really seeing this in what we're talking about with these fantasies. Is you've developed a fantasy in relation to an enjoyment that you don't have, and that fantasy may or may not be true. You don't actually know because you've never had the experience, but right. you've created something which has basically made you miserable. So are you? St- are you personally in agreement with Leotard who says actually what we desire is our own misery because it, it, it's sort of a, it's in relation to prohibition, right? It's like an internal prohibition. Right. I, I think that's absolutely true. But I don't think it's reserved for the workers. Like I think it's, I mean, to me, like, you know, I had my doctor once was a, a former doctor of mine was a, for a while, a doctor to the rich and famous. And he said, you know, I prescribed 10 times the number of antidepressants when I was working for them than when I came to work in Vermont. And so I always th- I always thought that was such a great little life lesson. Like, so it's not the word, it's even more the rich and elite that desire their their own misery, right? So I think that I think that I don't think that that's a monopoly on the like the lower working or low class mm-hmm. or working class. So I think that's an important thing to say. And that I think it makes that statement less elitist and mm-hmm. You know, like just in the way that you you were critical of, uh, but I think that's absolutely true, and I think the structure of fantasy shows it, right? Like, think about. I, I like to use this example, like that, that. If you think about a Hollywood film and the relation to the object of desire, like the how how much of the running time of the film is the us actually having our desire fulfilled? It's usually like two minutes, right? Like mm. most of the time is. We're relating to this object. We don't have it. It's str- it's painful. We're in sus- like even the term suspense. We're in suspense. We where there's tension. I, I think about the film. It's a Wonderful Life. Since we're at the Christmas season, right? Like there's like two minutes at the end where he's like all the people bring and it. You know, you get a chill. Everyone brings the money in and it, it's great. But like two hours and ten minutes <laughs> of that film are about just misery. And you can't say like, oh, I just watched the whole beginning part just so I can get to the end. No, no. The ending is really the alibi so that you can enjoy the whole entire film, I think. Like the pleasure of the ending is the alibi for the enjoyment of Mm. the suffering of the whole rest of the film. So I absolutely agree with that idea that that we fantasize our own suffering in a way in order to enjoy it. Mm. Okay. Well, maybe I'll bring in the absolute cliche. I think we might have mentioned this last time, actually. I mean, Marvel films. Yeah. The, the thing is, I mean, I don't know how many of these there are now. I think like uh, over 40 at least, right? Yeah, and I mean, I remember I always think back to Kurt Vonnegut where he draws the, the shape of stories. These stories are the same shape every time, right? There's a hero. They're doing quite good. Something bad happens. And then they make a comeback and they finally defeat, defeat the big bad villain every single time. Um, so in that, it seems that the fact that the most popular films going is that there's actually a suspension of belief because surely, I mean, I, I hope at least that everyone going into these films, they sort of know maybe subconsciously now that we know the the good guy's going to win. Right? That's what yeah. happens. And they do every single time, but they have to suspend their knowledge that that happens every single time so they can actually believe oh my god is the villain is the hero gonna die is, right. i mean that sounds quite dangerous though for the psyche to sort of just constantly you know suspend things so we can have that misery 
Or maybe we would just destroy everything if we didn't have that. We just sit there. And yeah, that's there. an interesting. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I was I always think back when I think of the popularity of the superhero film, and I think it's like the death of the of of, of, of society on Earth. I think, <laughs> well, you know, in the 1940s, they were making like four, three and a half westerns a, a week, mm. right? So, so, so it's really the same film structure. It's basically a, a, a just a contemporary version of the western, and you know, I don't know. So, I mean, that was the New Deal, right? So it was at least here. I mean, I, of course, it was Nazi Germany also. But uh, I don't know. So I, 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 I tend to agree with you, but I, I, that it, it's kind of a, that the, of course, the structure is absolutely the same. And I think it is, it is interesting. Like what you're saying about the role of disavowal, I think is pretty interesting, right? Like that, that you have to disavow in order to even enjoy the film. You have to disavow that you know the trajectory of the end. And I think the films kind of help you because sometimes they kill off a few of the heroes like mm. this uh, Avengers, I don't know what it was called, uh, <sighs> End Game or whatever it's called. I think like uh, Iron Man dies, uh, the Scarlett Johansson character dies, mm. I forget her name, uh, some Russian spy. Uh, so they're, they're, they're... I forgot. anyway, uh, but so so they those killing off a few allows you that i think that's what uh, that makes the disavow work right mm -hmm. like if you if it absolutely never ever happened then it would be a little harder don't you think like it'd be a little harder to go and say just like the occasional western film that had the hero die mm -hmm. it, it did happen it was very it's just like the marvel thing it very rarely happened but it did happen so i think it's the same kind of same kind of thing Mm. I mean, and that's interesting. I mean, maybe that's a theory as to why when it first released, Game of Thrones was so popular. Is because I remember people saying to me, "Oh, you got to be careful with Game of Thrones because you know characters actually die in it, as if that's right. like right." You know, I know main characters can actually die, right? We've sort of treaded into the realm of what can seriously happen, and we haven't suspended this weird thing. Oh, that's strange. I think that's why people like The Wire. Too. I mean, I think Wire is the greatest television show ever, but. I think that's one reason why people like it. Like people are just like characters that people love are just killed off. You know, they just, they're, they're killed off all the time. So I think that does make it, it, it ups the stakes for people that are watching. It. But I mean, the wire, the wire is a really good example actually, because it, I would say that the wire was the start of that. Dare I say this horrible word, which all academics hate postmodern trend in being, cynical and realistic and pessimistic yeah. with mainstream media which now we see in we see in a lot of cartoons now and i mean maybe this is maybe this is they've finally admitted to the fact that we don't we don't need a payoff and we don't need to suspend the misery we can just watch miserable tv and right. be miserable all day well that that's certainly like wire would be an example of that breaking bad i think is a perfect example of that like there there's nothing Redeeming. there's no payoff at all right no not really and it's not there's nothing really that redeeming about most of the characters well, i think that's I, to me that's i don't i like wire much more than breaking bad but mm. i think the one testament to why breaking bad is is good is that there's no one likable on it and you're still invested in the show like like it's very and, and why are everyone is likable i think you know even the even the people that are ruthless killers you're like oh eat yourself though. he's great you know like there's not and you know but I think on Breaking Bad, even the people that are relatively sympathetic are not really that ultimately that likable. But do you, do you think that's, I mean, maybe, you know, I've become quite optimistic in the last two years, which is, you know, surprised me. Do you think um, these sort of shows are sculpting a perspective of the world, which isn't really that true, that there is actually far more optimism and, and hope in the world than there is in these quite pessimistic shows? Yeah, I do. I mean, obviously, Breaking Bad is incredibly pessimistic, right? But I, yeah, I do. I, I'm I'm relatively optimistic about things because I do think that. The, I mean, I don't know. There, there seems to be a growing dissatisfaction with the capitalist, you know, uh, uh, hegemony, right? Like, there, it seems like there are a number of people that are fine. Like, I think just exactly what I talk about in this relic of a book, like, <laughs> like this kind of suffocation on over, over consumption, over command to enjoy, right? Like, I think that that there's a, there is, some, it seems like to me, there is some, 
I don't know, sense of not resistance to it, but just uh, like dissatisfaction with it. Mm. Like, you know, just like, and, 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 and it turned toward kind of a more minimalistic way of existing, you know, not like, I don't have to have everything. I can, I, I can just, I can actually just pare myself down to, to less. And I think, I actually think that is a attitude utterly incompatible with capital, you know? Yeah. I mean, do, do you think that's because in capitalism, your desire isn't, there's never a delay. Your desire is there. Right, right. Plus, plus you have to, I think it's, I mean, just think about the companies that are the most successful. They're not necessarily the most profitable today. They're the ones that promise the most future profit that never comes, right? Like, you know, like even Amazon, I think right now is not profitable, right? So, but it's by far the most powerful and, and attractive company because it has this promise of a future that's off that it'll never, it's like the green light at the end of Gatsby's, uh, you know, at the end of Daisy's dock. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting to look, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll, if I can find it, I'd, I'd send it to you. But if you look at Amazon's, I think it's the net worth chart. You, it, it literally is like this scene wave going up, like identical. And you realize that every time their profits get to a certain point, Bezos or whoever, I mean, that idea of Bezos in charge is a bit ridiculous now, I imagine. But they invest everything back into, I guess, what yeah. Deleuze and Guattari would say, right now is time to re deterritorialize and re territorialize, right? Like, right, right. It's interesting. We, we've, exha I, 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 we've exhausted this. Right, right. I have a friend who said that uh, a friend that works worked in finance and now he's come into academia, but he, he, he pointed out to me that they, the profit for them is like a spigot that they can just turn off on and off whenever they, whenever they want, just in the way you said, cause they can just, they can just put it back in and, and, and stop it. So. Do you think that's what happens when, when, a, you know, a hegemonic power under capitalism grows so big, they control desire basically. I think that's right. I mean, you know, I was just talking this morning with a couple of people who were lamenting Amazon and yet said, I couldn't help. I just spent like a thousand dollars out of the holidays on Amazon. So, yeah, I think that that's really, really true. Although, you know, I don't I tend not to blame the the this figure in charge, but to mm. say that like, that figure is an expression of of everyone's desire. Right. Like I think like so, like I don't know. I hear so many people like Trump, Trump, Trump. I just think like Trump's a form mm. that's articulated a kind of collective desire structure. So I don't, I don't, I think the same is true with Bezos. Like I'm sure he's a horrible guy in person, but he's, he's not, I don't think he's singularly responsible for the phenomenon or Amazon. Like I think that they're an expression of a certain kind of moment within capital. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a ridiculous idea to think that, I mean, any, anyone in that, in that sense that, that I, I would perhaps, agree with this that times have their their zeitgeist really their spirit yeah. and people are formed in them but someone like bezos didn't sit down at age 20 and go i'm gonna become a multi-billionaire and yeah, you know, yeah. Like, how it, can it, i destroy it, the world right yeah like, he didn't make that it's like a process of being dragged along by whatever's and, well, and i under, think it's he understood it true. i guess yeah 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 i think it's so. especially true under capitalism james because there you know there's there's certain objective structure and if you don't play by the capitalist rule, you just fail, right? Like, like if you don't, like, say, uh, you know, uh, offshore jobs, well, some other company is going to do it, produce the same thing for less, and then you're going to be out of business. So it's not like, oh, there's a, like, I remember when Michael Moore made Roger and Me, the first documentary, and he, he, he like, attacked Nike for their outshoring of, of jobs. And I was like, okay yeah that's bad of nike but they're just responding to the exigencies of capital and if if nike didn't do it then adidas and new balance they'd all do it they'd sell their shoes for less nike'd be producing these shoes no one would buy because they all they'd cost they'd be made with american labor they'd cost more so it's just it seems to me like a, a way of not understanding the way capitalism works like capitalism you're never the individual isn't guilty Right. Like that's the whole that's the whole point, like that, because they're completely interchangeable, like someone else. If you didn't do it, someone else is going to do it, I think. Mm. And I think that's I think that's a really important. And I think too often the left gets involved in this like individual, like, oh, there's certain bad guys. And, you know, I don't know. I mean, this is a big, a big discussion that I've always been interested in is this this within capitalism, this this balancing act between, you know, down with the corporations, but also, well, you know, it's like 
yeah, Amazon's bad, but who's buying from Amazon? And I mean, where do you stand in relation to that? You just mentioned your friend who said, you know, I really hate Amazon, but this morning I just bought $1,000 worth of Amazon. It's yeah. like, do you think it's a balancing act? Like it's actually, the, the it's, it's a responsibility of both? Or do you think, well, actually, if individuals collectively said, no, I'm, I'm not buying from Amazon anymore, do you think that the responsibility is with the individual? Well, I think it's both. I think you're right to say it's both. I mean, I, I don't think... You know, yeah, I think there could be this collective decision, but then if you're buying from somebody else, what's the difference? I mean, I'm not, I'm not so keen on this, like, uh, I don't know, what do they call it? Like conscientious capitalism, conscientious consumption. I just think like those, that seems oxymoronic to me. Yeah. I just, you know, I, 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 yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I don't think that, I think once you're on the once you're consuming and buying, then you're consuming and buying. I'm not sure that it's like, okay, one company might do be worse for the environment than the other, but I, I, I don't know. Mm. I mean, they're, I think they're mostly interchangeable. Do you, do you think it's, I mean, everyone consumes because people have to eat and live. Do, yeah, you, do yeah. you think it's how you're mentally consuming? Like there's a capitalistic I, I do think way that. of Right, consuming. right, right, right. Exactly, exactly, right. Are you invested? Have you bought into the capitalist fantasy of like, I can... I can find this, you mentioned Garden of Eden earlier, right? Like I can, I can return to that Garden of Eden where there's a, or a land of cocaine where I can, I can, there's just, you know, the fruit falls from the tree into my hands. Like, I think that that, I don't think, my idea would be, I don't think capitalism can function without that fantasy, without mm. that fantasy of some, this is why I think the alienation of modernity is also has, even though you're right to say modernity is capitalist, but there's also this underside, this other side, not underside, other side that's anti-capitalist within modernity because it says, no, my alienation is constitutive. I can't be overcome no matter how many commodities I get. Whereas I think capitalism has to say to us, you get the right commodity or enough of them, you'll overcome your alienation. Like that's, I think mm. Bezos, he goes up into, space he thinks oh i'll i can avoid alienation once i leave the earth's uh, gravitational field or whatever right but no you're still suffering alienated he comes down and of course what could he say it was amazing it was trans no but of course what was it like it was probably like it was bumpy mm. it wasn't that great i mean of i can just imagine like it's like the sex thing we were talking about like he has to tell us it was it was like amazing, but it's like the opposite of the sex thing because he wants us to invest in that fantasy of what he experienced. Whereas any normal person would say like, okay, space, I guess it's fine, but you're still like the same. You're like, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but Adam Sandler does this thing about he, he's mocking. Have you seen this? It's a he does it's a it's a he's mocking a travel agency, and he says like we could take you to all these places, but the problem is that you're still you when you get to these places, right? And that, I think to me, that's one of the great lessons of psychoanalysis, right? Like you, the, the, that, that alienation is constitutive and no matter what you get or accumulate, you're stuck with that. Mm. And so I think that that is what, but capitalism cannot abide that, I think. Oh, absolutely not. I mean, it was always one of my favorite things to hear when people say they've gone traveling. I'm going traveling to find myself. Well, yeah, you, yeah. you're already here though so but um i mean it's really interesting that you mention bezos going to space uh, and obviously musk going to space because yeah. actually I didn't, I didn't really put two and two together until now because i had a question about you know you mentioned uh thoreau you know walden and this this you you read thoreau's uh journey to walden pond where he lived for a while as this journey out of the order of the symbolic right some some yeah. attempt to get out of it and i mean dare i say it is bezos doing the same thing as Thoreau. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's absolutely right, right? Like he's trying to, like the attempt to get into space is to get out of that symbolic structure that pens everyone else in, right? Like, mm. oh, look, I, and that's why there's this competition among them. Like, I'm going to be the one to get at, like, I think the Virgin Airlines guy too, right? He, Bronson, he wanted to, he, they, they all wanted to go. I think he beat Bezos and that was a thing, but Musk too. Like they all have that idea of, of of escaping our like they think oh if we're on mars we don't have the symbolic structure we don't have constitutive lack we don't have all these you know mm -hmm. things that come with being so, a subject. so beneath that it seems that what that journey symbolically is is a means to like put another few thousand miles on our desires right so it's like yeah. oh man you have to go to space yeah, you know, like, yeah. but we'll never know. So that's something now. That's, that's like right. Right. A huge Can you leap. imagine? <laughs> right. 
it's the perfect thing, right? Because most of us have no way of ever affording to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, he comes back, he's like, it's amazing. And everyone, there's no way you come back and are like, well, it was fine. <laughs> you know, like you just, there's no way someone's going to say yeah. that. So I think you're absolutely right that it's putting a few more miles between us and the fantasy object. Maybe because the problem with Amazon is it brings all the fantasy objects too close. We could get them in two days, right? If you mm. have prime shipping. And so this way he's going to say, well, wait a minute. There's still some fantasy objects that even Amazon can't, can't get you. Maybe that's what we need, because I remember reading an interview of Neil Armstrong where he used to joke about, you know, he'd go to places like the pyramids and he'd say, yeah, it's good, but you know, what I mean? <laughs> but you, you haven't seen the Earth from space. Maybe we need to crowdfund someone to go to space, come back and say, yeah, it was all right. Yeah, like yeah. it was all right. I wonder the, what that would do, you know, would that sort of yeah, I think crack something over? Yeah, yeah. What, no, always seriously, like what do you think? What do you think? That, that would do to the collective do you think people would then suddenly be a bit more anchored and say actually this is quite good that would be great but i fear that it'd be the same problem with the sex thing we talked about in the beginning right like people wouldn't believe it mm. they'd say like it was so great they couldn't even they they just had to kind of play it down to us so oh dear are, are you i mean just out of interest are you are you a space is that do you just see that as a complete sort of 80s fantasy or do you think that's no 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 i'm not i i i love star trek i'm not <laughs> i i'm a i i'm a kind of utopian about space like i did not think it's a waste of money space travel i i think nasa in in the u.s i mean i i i think it's unfortunate that it developed out of the cold war right so it probably wouldn't have even developed if there wasn't this international war being fought but i think public money spent on space exploration is i'm absolutely for it so I don't, I'm not one of these people that thinks like, spend the money down here, don't waste it on, mm. you know, I'm absolutely for it. Like, I think, I don't know, I feel like that kind of, ex, just that, that, that desire to explore the universe, I, I, I'm totally, I'm on, the, I'm on board with that. So. Mm. Okay. Okay. I mean, jumping back, our whole conversation so far, it's really been based around this sort of gap that can just never be, mm -hmm. be, you know, leapt, um, because really for there to be any desire at all there has to be this like there has to be a wall that you just can't that's right you, the, the thing you can't see you can't something that you like oh, i need to experience this or i need to consume yeah. this and then you get it and then you find the next thing so in that in that way i mean can desire and enjoyment ever really overlap yeah, yeah i think it's in, that's a great question james and i think most people thinking psychoanalytically think that they don't right they think that they're you know there's always this kind of but i think there's all there's another way that and I think that's true for this enjoyment like ultimate enjoyment right like this mystical kind of union with the object whatever but I do think there's an enjoyment of desiring right like there's an enjoyment in like when you're like we we're talking about it's a wonderful life there like you can enjoy the first two hours and ten minutes of the film and because you enjoy your desiring like you enjoy like you're relating to the object from a distance and there's something enjoyable in that. But I think what's interesting is that capital doesn't allow you to avow that as enjoyment. Like that's just a preamble to what I'm gonna really get. Mm. The pay like I'm always looking forward to the big payoff. I don't really recognize that actually what I'm enjoying is this way I don't have the thing, like the way I'm relating to it from a distance, right? Like, and I think that that is, that we need to see that also as a, different but a form of enjoyment so so yes i think there is a fundamental break between desire and enjoyment mm. but i think there's a another kind of way to think about enjoyment that's aligned with desire that's that's just a just the way in which we desire so i mean if, if that's the case and and uh, what would you make of the maybe the theory that something could be broken i think we may have spoken about this last time but maybe not in relation to enjoyment that something in capitalism could perhaps be broken if we truly did get to the case where you know some sci-fi fantasy where you have a desire you press a button it's there you know to the point where enjoyment almost becomes com impossible because there is zero prohibitions do you think at that point capitalism actually if we accelerate enjoyment to the point where we're always enjoying ourselves that's when we might break through to some authenticity or genuine Maybe. desire yeah i think that's pretty good because 
you know, that I think that's even the vision of Star Trek. They have this device called the replicator. So you just press the button and you're like, I don't know, chicken soup and you just get it, mm. right? Like there's no, they have a thing that just makes whatever you want. And so I think that that, I think you're, you're kind of onto something that there is something about that that would be, that would get us out. But that's why I think you have to imagine that capitalism would try to introduce some kind of obstacle into that right like some mm. way that it didn't just work out i think that's i think that's interesting maybe, maybe uh sorry to ask you this a hypothetical question uh, yeah. what would you do if all your desires were met i don't know i'm gonna <laughs> say something james something stupid like i i kind of feel like they all are right now like i don't feel i don't feel i never feel desire for something i don't have, I, really? Guess. I really don't yeah no i just I just kind of, I never, you know, one of the, th this is, just, this is my own stupid, I, this is not theoretical, this is my own stupid proclivity, but I just, I never really think about, I've never had a goal in my life. And I know, I don't think about anything long-term. I just kind of get up and I'm like, okay, I'm going to read this book and I'm going to try to write this other book. And, and, but I'm not thinking like, oh, once I get that, I'll do something. I'm just thinking about the, like the here and now of it. So mm. I don't really it's funny because I talk about desire a lot, but I don't really feel like I'm driven by that. Like I, I'm, I want to get to this next thing or something. So, so, I really... so sort of ironically, I mean, this, this isn't, I mean, this is almost anathema to the left wing position because, you know, I understand the left wing position now is to sort of reinstill the future with the hope that they had, you know, people going about May 68 or revolution, yeah. like revolution is about this idea that the future could be, something more right this idea of no future which comes from mark fisher um yeah. is something that's been used to say look we need to start talking about the future again right in, a, in an optimistic way yeah but actually you're you're about something else that desire is entirely reliant on the future so you sort of, sort of cut it off at the root or rip the root out and say well what about now what if we yeah. start acting in a way which would undermine the things we don't like now i think that's right and i think i think that it's interesting because I think capitalism too relies on a certain notion of a better future. And so I think like rejecting that better future is, is an important anti, even though it's like in service ultimately of a better future. Right. But it's, I think it's a way, I think I'd really think that that like not investing yourself in the future is an important anti-capitalist step to take. Yeah. Mm. So basically capitalism's worst nightmare is to say, I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm fi fine. I'm fine. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Think about it, right? Like the, the, like the, I've always thought this, that like if someone's trying to sell me something, then I know I don't need it, right? Like, because if I needed it, I would be going to them, right? Mm -hmm. So I, and I think that that's really a, that's a kind of a lesson, right? Like, don't just don't, like, I'm fine. I like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sufficient. But then why would you do anything outside well, of, outside of driven, eating? And... No, I understand. But mm. because you're driven by, you know, your, the the enjoyment that you get from being fine right like that there's a kind of enjoyment in the striving itself that's not i think this is to me really important that's not tied to the goal that you're trying to to get right like you're just there's an enjoyment just in the activity itself and i think maybe i'm wrong about this but i've always thought the capitalist needs the the ultimate like carrot at the end Whereas I think like something like, I don't know, I would call it like socialism or communism. Just it, it's like the striving itself is the end in itself. And that's, I mean, it come to come back to what we we're talking about space. Like that's what I think about space exploration too. There's a certain striving for it on its own, not because it'll give us more profit or do anything, but just because we're striving and that's what we do. Right. And, but there, but I don't think that's antithetical to the notion that I'm fine. I think that's actually endemic to the notion. I'm mm. fine. So do you, do you do you think in a world without advertising that there may still be people who, you know, want the fast car or the flash suit, but they want it for their own reasons in a way? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. you know what I mean. Like, question. like yeah. that's what I mean. Is a lot of the things that you know, I, I have to admit to myself that a lot of the things I've bought, I've thought, think back and I thought, at a certain point in my life, I obviously never even knew that thing existed, and now yeah. I apparently want it. So I wonder yeah. if in a world without adverts or a world without that sort of coercive, you know, you right. really need this dishwasher or whatever, would there be people who would say like, 
would would come to that conclusion they actually probably, do need right? it right yeah. right i think that's probably true like i think we shouldn't be i i again i just comes back to what we were talking about earlier like i i'm just less i i'm not sure that people are manipulated that much right like i think that like just like you're saying like i think like who do we put it on is it the company or is it the consumer that are like so i don't know like i think people like it's clear that capitalism is tied into certain desires and fantasies that people have. It's not just like, Oh, all of humanity has got manipulated. And it's mm. like, I mean, Hegel says this about religion. I think it's a really good point. He's like, look, people can't be collectively deceived to that great of extent. Like there, there must be something in religion that appeals to some of their actual desire. Otherwise like priests couldn't be that good at manipulating people. Like he just, he just thinks that that, like we're not going to succumb to something that's totally foreign to what we desire. And yeah. I, I think that's, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Well, I mean, yeah, I guess there's something almost inherently anti-capitalistic about religion, because as you say with the salesman, if a salesman says like one time to me, you should really do this thing. That's like a, a little bit, but if they kept selling it, I'd be like, as you said, yeah, right, I'd be like, right. well, hang on. Why, why do you, why do you feel the need to right. persuade me? You know, right. Are you, uh, do you mind if I ask, are you a religious man? Uh, I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because I grew up really a fundamentalist and then I broke from that. Mm. But I have to say, when I wrote my uh, book on Hegel, I kind of came around to a kind of Christianity that, that was different than what I grew up, much different than what I grew up with. But I liked this notion in Hegel of God as divided, God as split. And I, 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 I'm, and, 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 God and, and this this split of God manifesting itself in Christ, I really found that very appealing. So, yeah, I guess I I guess I am. So I'm more of a is that a, a sort of a free Christian, free. As, they, <laughs> as they call them, right? That was like Kierkegaard, you know. The yeah, day. yeah. No, I love Kierkegaard too. But uh, yeah, I I think that that something like I I like the notion that in Christianity of the that that, that Christ is the death of God of the beyond, and I think that I'm not sure that there's another way of thinking that gets us out of the notion of the beyond that in the way that Christianity does. And I think that's to me, and I think you're right to say that capitalism and religion are in, certainly anathemas, or at least Christianity for sure. Um, but I, I think that, and I, I think that capitalism, just like you were talking about, relies on this notion of an ultimate beyond. Mm -hmm. And I think Christianity really is the rejection of an ultimate, even though I think most Christians are invested in the notion of I'm I'm going to become Christian, so I'm going to get a payoff right mm. at the end. But I think that's anathema. Yes, I would agree. I mean, I would say that to think about it in the terms of you know bearing one's cross, capitalism right. would want to invent invent a gizmo to carry the cross, right? That's right. That's and they would want to absolutely. keep inventing better gizmos right. as about, as opposed to well, maybe you should just suffer, but not. I don't know. It's the misery. It's acceptance of misery. No, I think that's, I, I'm absolutely for acceptance of misery. Yeah, I think that I'm absolutely for it. Like, I think that, you know, a friend of mine, uh, Rick Boothby, has had this thing about Casablanca. You know, he said, like, so in Casablanca, Rick suffers from Ilsa dumping him, right, mm -hmm. in Paris. And then in the end, what does he do? He, like, makes her dump him again, <laughs> basically. But he does it, right? So, so he... So Rick's idea was this is really what enjoyment is, right? Like it's not <laughs> like this pure suffering imposed on me. It's like, okay, I'm going to see this misery, this suffering, and I'm going to actually impose it on myself. Mm. And I think that to me, I think that's a pretty good way of thinking about enjoyment. So going back right back to the start of a conversation about, you know, yeah. those when you're a teenager and you're yearning to lose your virginity, really we should be saying to those people, you don't understand. You're enjoying yourself now. This is real enjoyment. Right, right. Absolutely right. Like I, I think back on that a lot because I think that was the time when I was really, I don't think I ever had as intense enjoyment as I did when I was looking around and imagining and fantasizing about the sexuality of others, right? Like that. So, and I think once you cross that line, you're like, eh, you know, it was like, you know, yeah. And it's and it's tough as well to sort of go back to the fantasy that you had. You know, you can't because it's it's. I been, don't think you can. Do you think you can? I think you can? Yeah. I think you can sort of recollect, but it's in a weird memory because it's a complete state of mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's and, really hard. Yeah, I think that's right. Like, I guess it's, I, it's the Wizard of Oz thing, right? It's like behind the curtain, and you can't then step out because then you know you're pretending. Right. 
right right it comes back to what you were saying about like can you tell like watching the marvel film like can you tell yourself you don't know how it ends but you you know you kind of can but i think you're right like once you've seen behind the curtain you can't really re-erect the curtain fully mm. there's a sadness to that though there's a sadness i think to that's that really true right right like i find i mean i'm not going to say what my particular fantasy is but i <laughs> i still kind of live out the same or have the same psychic fantasy but I, it's 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 in a sad way, like you're saying, because I I, st- I don't really believe it anymore. But I don't have another, I don't have another one to go to because it's Man, the one that structured have, my entire I life. I have the I have the same thing. I have the same thing, and I, I'll happily admit my fantasy because mine has been, ex- basically doing the Thoreau exit to the woods, Heidegger. But I know, yeah, I right? I know. I mean, I've done, I had jobs with hard labor before. I was a carpenter for a long time. I know. That on the first day of that fantasy, I'd be getting up at like, you know, seven in the morning, going to get water. And I think, I wish I was back in my cozy yeah. office, right? And now I know that. I'm like, why did you admit that to yourself? You know, yeah. why did you dispel it? Right, right. It's unfortunate. Right, it does. I think it's just really hard. <laughs> like you, you still, you don't get rid of it, right? You still have the fantasy, but you, you relate to it differently because you, you, just as you said, you see behind the curtain. So there is a pro, and so enjoyment then is, it's a self-prohibition of don't be too self-critical about your fantasies. Right, I think that's right. <laughs> I think it is, I think it's a kind of self, I think it's a, you erect your own, like that's the thing, isn't it? Like you take on, you don't rely on the other to provide the obstacle. Like you see the way in which I'm responsible for my own obstacle. And I can, and can I enjoy, can I enjoy that obstacle? Like, that's the thing. Like, can I enjoy the obstacle that's in the way of getting to my fantasy object without trying to get to it? Because once you actually get to it, then it's it's kind of just like we're saying, it's kind of collapsed. Mm. And I would say that's in our discussion between the difference between capitalism and Christianity actually is Christianity is all about that understanding the obstacle and the journey for what it right. is as the experience. And capitalism is about... You don't want the you don't want the journey. You don't want the journey. You want you want the first car now, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Like right, like so. To me, it's the difference between even the symbols of of Catholicism and Protestantism, right? Like Christ is still on the cross mm. in the crucifix, but then the Protestant Church, it's there. We've gotten rid of that suffering. You can just get right to the cross. It's just a bare symbol, and so I think that that's the that's why the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capital, right? Like they fit together. Uh, in it's been it's t- it's made to fit right like i think you're right that it's absolutely alien but then it's it's like jury rigged to fit into the capitalist structure well they well they t- they took away all all tradition in the process right. so you know you no longer have like oh by the way you still you know i know we've been baptized and we've ticked the box but catholics would say well you still need to be good you still need right. to do the journey you still need right. to try and there's still hurdles whereas as you say protestant you know once saved forever saved right i'm sure there's denominations which aren't like that maybe but i don't know but yeah you know i have max weber to read but uh it's there yeah already yeah would you recommend it it's good yeah it's the problem is that you can if i gave you a precy of that book you've already read that book right like it's not one of these books that has like a lot of other things like the bait it has the basic idea and that's just that's it but it's fine yeah, that's nice yeah. every now and again when you read. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I enjoy. It's enjoyable to read. He's, he's enjoyable. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Okay. Um, one thing I'll add in um, is, you know, just because I mean I'm sure you 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 must have seen it in the news and probably thought about it a lot. But do you see the metaverse as as, as a step in the well, in a wrong direction in a very yeah worrying... absolutely <laughs> and I also think it's totally. <laughs> You know, that that's interesting. I didn't think about that in terms of this book, but it would be like if I was writing that book today, that would be my main example of like this is a world where you can or a universe you can go into where you don't have to suffer from any kind of prohibition at all. Right. Like that's the whole that's the whole point. But it's interesting because. I, it's not a good movie, but Steven Spielberg made this movie Ready Player One, which is actually about a metaverse. I secretly love it because it's so, so much. It's too much. I, I agree. It's too <laughs> That's a, No, James, exactly what you're saying is exactly right. And, and I think it kind of shows, exposes the problem with the idea, right? In, inadvertently. I don't think he's trying to do that. 
but I think it does it does expose the problem that that, that like you get to, you get all this too much and then you're like wait a minute do you how can we reintroduce some kind of lack into this into this world right? mm. yeah yeah I remember I mean it was uh if you look at it like that in the pretentious way it was an experience of you know the, the idea of easter eggs in films I mean to talk of this lack if you're if you're in on the if you're in on the joke if you're in on it there's a few in films right yeah. but but they you know someone said that ready player one is just this easter egg reference fest of basically right. It's, it's like affirmation that you are in the symbolic order. You know right, it. Right, right. Man. So, yeah, I mean, the, uh, but I guess with the metaverse, once again, there's that suspension because you have to suspend the fact that you know right. you're, you're maybe sat in some dingy flat somewhere. I know, I know. <laughs> Isn't that the, that's the thing, right? Like it's a, it's a, and I think this is pretty fascinating, the way that fetishistic disavow, which is what we're talking about, mm. like it's become so much more prominent i think and i think the metaverse would be just installing it into like the actual structure of our psyche right like because you're right you couldn't even you couldn't even go into it if you didn't perform that function of disavowal right like that's in a way i think that might be part of the appeal right like you you have to do the disavowal in order to even take the step to to put on the glasses or however you do it i don't even know how they're going to have you do it Mm. Are you are you are you gonna jump into the metaverse? No, I just <laughs> I find it kind of boring. I I mean, just for the reason that we're talking about. Like I just like I remember I I I don't know a couple of years ago I was in Chicago and I tested just a thing where you put it on your head and you're in the virtual. And I just I found it so tedious. I just it's very hard for me to. I guess it's hard for hard for someone such as yourself. You said you don't really have desires. If you've got no desires to bring to a world where you can bring about any desire, then it's the capitalist thing. You're undermining it. You've got nothing right. to offer me. Right, right, <laughs> right. That's how I feel about every, like metaverse, all these kinds of things, right? Like, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I'm I'm sort of interested. I mean, when you say you've got no desires, what's the last thing you bought and you were uh, you you maybe thought. I never knew I wanted this, you know. Oh, well, okay. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I have actually a good, this is a good capitalist desire. So <laughs> I, I I have a little, we have a little fund from, as professors, you know, and mm -hmm. so we can use it to buy stuff. Uh, and I'm going to buy uh, Freud's Verka in German. So that that's that's my, and it's pretty expensive. It's like over a thousand dollars. So oh, his whole, it's, it's collected. Yeah, his whole thing. It's just yeah. collected works. So, okay. so. That, that that's so that's i'm pretty excited about that <laughs> did you did you imagine it on your shelves where it's gonna go uh well i have the collected works in english on my shelf uh, so and i and that was also like fifteen hundred dollars so uh so there so i have some things yeah i have hegel's collected works in german and that's you know it's not but i don't care like i don't put it prominent where people can see it. i just you know i like to have them all there but i don't it's not so that people can see it, you know. Yeah, but I mean, is that doing the same thing that you're, that's actually making it so you hope people will? You're like, you know, they go near it and you're, you, your heart No, starts. I don't, I, I mean, James, I can see why. <laughs> I'm, that kidding, I'm be, kidding, I'm but kidding. But I don't, I don't feel, I don't, I don't feel that way. Like, I, I mean, maybe unconsciously, maybe you're, you're right about that, but I don't. I get, maybe I do. <laughs> no, but maybe, maybe it's telling of my sort of capitalistic psyche that, I'm not saying I don't believe you, but the the fact if you said to people, no, I'm actually not fussed if you see, I just have this, if someone said to you that they had a really flash Porsche and they, yeah. and they, it was out in their drive or tucked away and they said, no, actually, I'm, I'm actually not fussed if other people see it, we would be reluctant to believe that because we know that their desire, we believe their desire is to do with. Right, right. Let me just say, like, <laughs> I, I, we have a ton of DVDs and I know now that DVDs, no one has them. So that mm. it seems unusual that we have, we have like 2000 or something. So when people come in and they see them, I feel ashamed. I kind of feel that way about the Freud too. Like I'm like, eh, it's a little expensive. I feel like, why did I spend it on that? So I feel ashamed, but but I don't know. Like the the the. I guess here's the one thing that I'm secretly proud of when they if they see like the collected Hegel in German. Like it took me a lot to learn German, so I'm kind of like proud that I can read Hegel in German. And so I, I, I guess about that one, I, I, I do have this kind of secret, like, oh, well, if they see that, then okay. 
So there's nothing wrong with pride, though. There's nothing wrong with being proud of something. I guess, but it's tied to commodity, right? Mm. Like it's yeah, yeah. Yeah. I feel I'm more in favor of shame than pride. I have to say, I don't. <laughs> what do you, I, what, I don't. What do you mean? Uh, you make, it, no, you'd, make just, a, you'd make a good Catholic. I know. I would. I would. I just is a pathology. I just feel. I just. It's my own pathology. Like I. I don't like any kind of attention brought to my whatever I've done. Like I just like you know. So this is an example. It's a stupid example, but our school, had, our department puts all the professor's books in a sh in a glass case, I would never, ever, ever allow any of my books to be put in that case. Like, I just think like, to like show up to like, why to, do like, you why do you write? Because I think, well, I know, like, that's a good point. Like, maybe it, or, there's secretly this. I'm not no, I'm not thing. saying that you're uh, I'm not doing that thing where unconsciously you want people to see it because there are people yeah. who write publish and it's like, you know, I just wanted to write. I, well, I feel like I, there are certain ideas that I think are really important, and I want to try to get them out there as widely diffused as I can. So I feel like I just a, I, I feel like a proselytizer, right? you know. Like that's why you know, I get invited. On, I go. I do. I do like podcasts like twice a month. I get invited, and I just do them all. And my spouse Hillary, she's like, "Why do you? You know, like you kind of don't." It's hard for you to interact with people, and you don't, you know, you got you get overscheduled. Why? Do you, I'm like, well, I feel like I want to get the idea out there, and if if I'll do it in any way I can. So I so I, that's why I write as many books as I can. Like I feel like, and I do the like YouTube things, podcast, my own podcasts. Like mm -hmm. I just do it to try to disseminate it as much as I can. Like I think it. Like I don't do. I don't know. I don't do like a lot of charity work or anything. So I feel like it's my way of like trying to give back to the world. Not that I'm like God's gift to. No, no, no. I, I, I completely. Uh, that's that's. I mean, maybe we're both in the same. Well, I think we're in the same boat because that's how I see it as well. Uh, yeah. Is like, well, I don't, I don't. The, not to push myself up, but these are my talents. Yeah. My I have a talent for reading philosophy and being able to disseminate it. So it's sure. like, well, I'll use it where is best, which is doing that's this. Right. Right? That's right. No, that's exactly how I feel. Exactly how I feel. And that's why, like, I get people emailing me all the time. Can you explain? And I'm happy to do it. Like, I think that's just kind of what I, that's sort of my, what I can give back, what I can do. So. Do you sometimes get caught out there? Because I'm, I'm much the same. I mean, I've uh, I have asked you a couple of personal, more personal questions on this somewhat related but sometimes when people have interviewed me about the stuff i've done they'll slide in a sudden personal question i'm i'm like taken out of the the you know the the zone i'd cordoned off the conversation to yeah. be about it's like are we talking about philosophy fine and then someone will ask about something else i don't mind that because james <laughs> like my whole teaching method i just was reading my evaluations for last semester and they're like well, the class is fine, but there are all these personal anecdotes. I don't know what the hell they have to do. So, like, I use that all the I use, like, my own life and existence as a kind of theoretical example all the time. Mm. So I don't have any problem with any kind of personal. In fact, it's, like, it's a little perverse. Like, I, I'll, <laughs> you know, like a kind of exhibitionist sort of element to my, even my thinking. Like, I'll even in my, in a lot of my books, like, I have details that are maybe too personal even then i'll put usually i put them in footnotes not in the actual text but yeah i don't i don't i i don't cordon off i probably should you know and i like sometimes my spouse will listen she'll go what in the hell why did you reveal that like you're just too you're a revealer it's just so a yeah a revealer i mean that's the opposite yeah. thing from the enjoyment we were talking about that like, it is it is it's interesting show everything and yeah, not hold anything yeah, back yeah yeah but a lot of times, I think, James, I don't know about, the, about you, but I think a lot of times my thinking goes against my own personal proclivities. You know, like I'm, I'm theorizing in a way against my, against what my own proclivity is. Oh, pre pre preachers never practice. Right, right. There you, you, know, you know what I mean? I mean, I, I have a fantasy of exiting to the woods and here I am sat and sat talking right. to you with a load of technology, right? It's like, right, right, I have to right. admit that at some point and that's dispelled everything. So now, yeah, yeah. Uh, now I have to sort of admit to myself, you know, and I'm sure someone will probably clip this for somewhere, but I, pr I probably begrudgingly like the modern world right. more more than I want to say to myself I do. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Same with capitalism, maybe. Yeah, no, I think it's... with capitalism, it's the big issue, right? Right. I think that's a real question. I think it's a real question. And I think even the people that are the most critical of it, to what extent are they getting off on their criticism? And then thus needing 
the very thing they're critical of. I mean, to bring it back to the preacher, like the pre- like you know, the preacher needs the sinful, the need needs the sinner to even have a job, right? So, mm. so that I think, and that, I think there's really a way in which the preacher gets off on the sin. Just and I think the critic of capitalism can find themselves getting off on the very capitalist thing that they're criticizing. I mean, I think to bring it back to Bezos, I hear when I hear the people the loathing in their voice for Bezos, I'm like, don't enjoy Bezos quite so much maybe right like there so i think there's a that's a real issue i think yeah I thought, uh, you know that, that that construction of bezos as a symbol and i mean like like a lot of sort of people who've been pushed to and i, I sort of like this about elon musk that when he gave one of his public talks on stage about the the one that's meant to go to mars a couple of years ago now he was like going um um uh he's a really awkward guy and i remember thinking yeah, yeah. that's sort of no offense to uh, Musk, you know, he. I think he is just quite a nerdy guy yeah, who's yeah. then been pushed in this position. But I like that as a dispelling of the the figure, right? Like Bezos yeah, yeah. is probably just a dude. Yeah, you know, yeah, 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 that's true. <laughs> but I he, absolutely think yeah. I think that's a really important move, actually. That to 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 take down that fantasy structure around those figures, like oh my god, they're so awash in enjoyment, they're so incredible. Like no, 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 they're probably just like every day. Or, you know, they probably wish they could still go to McDonald's and not be recognized, you know, like all the, all the kinds of things. Mm, mm. Well, luckily I don't, I don't have that problem. So right, I don't either. Right. I no. could still, if I ate meat, I would go to McDonald's quite are, a bit. Oh, are you vegan? Yeah. I, I'm, 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 I'm vegan only functionally just because I, I can't eat dairy and, and I don't like eggs. So, but I'm not, I don't have a kind, I just, I'm vegetarian, like politically, whatever, but mm ethically but not vegan that way but i just i i just sort of de facto vegan <laughs> okay okay and um, i will okay and, and if i don't mind the suffering i'll go out for in vermont we have this thing called a creamy it's mm-hmm. basically it's like a soft serve it's a funny word i know like it sounds very sexual mm-hmm. um but it's a it's just a soft serve ice cream and it there's like one ev- there's stands everywhere and they're they're great they're delicious and so occasionally i'll have one so i can't say i'm a vegan okay okay yeah. I mean, there's your desire. You didn't see I it. I know. Right? That, right, right, right. <laughs> Around food, I have to say, like, I, 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 I love eating. So I, I, I do, I do have a kind of, but I don't, I, I, I detest like fancy eating. Like, so I don't have that desire, like, oh, I want to go to a fancy restaurant. Like for me, that's why I said like McDonald's would be, if I ate meat, it'd be, that would be fine for me. That level of, that level, level of like quality is okay. Well, I mean, a lot of that's to do with collective uh, desire and enjoyment about you know, right. or it's three Michelin star, right? Well, you're going to enjoy it more because you're going to focus on it more, right? Right. Um, right. I don't, I don't, but, I, but yeah, I mean, I, I I like fancy food, but that's just because I'm British and we're terrible. That's right. you know? so I, I, yeah. that my yeah. desire is to eat something that actually tastes of anything. I know, I know. Well, I mean, that's that's the funny thing. Like people ask me how I've been to London many times, and people ask me, I'm like, you know, London is amazing, but mm. it's really hard to get like a good, like a, just a good tasting <laughs> meal there. It's a, like in contrast to like Berlin, where especially for a vegetarian, Berlin is, it's like, the, it's like mm. heaven on earth. It's mm. incredible. But yeah. But what did, what did London, you, I'm assuming you probably had chips in London. I, chips are great. No, London, they're right. Like I often would go to a place and just, I would have, my dinner would be chips. <laughs> Like the, that's so British, though, right? Like if you think know, about but, that like, in terms of it, it's but a potato. The, the, I, know, I know, but the veggie burger they would serve was just unedible. So I would just, I'd say, like, can I have a double order of chips? And then that would be, that was like a salad and a double. That was fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, um, are you are you uh, working on any books at the moment? Yeah. So I have this book coming out in next late next year i think called the racist fantasy so that's about that's what coming out and then i also i'm doing this one called enjoying right and left which is about the different structure how how there's a basic leftist relation to enjoyment and the basic rightist in relation to enjoyment so that those are my two little things do you see those forms of those enjoyment as the same well the idea is that enjoyment is just one thing but there's mm. two different ways to relate to it and that the the right has to relate to it through the other, like through the other that we hate as the enemy, right? Like, okay. so, so under like anti-communism, it'd be the communist enjoyer. It'd be under like today, it'd be the immigrant who's enjoying, but we, 
through our hatred of the immigrant, that's how we enjoy. So that's that. So whereas with the left, it's identification with that figure, right? Like so. So like I think about the Black Lives Matter protests, and you know how they they the, the some of the things they would say are like um, uh, hand, hands up, don't shoot, or I can't breathe. Like they like identification with the figure of the outsider, excluded figure of non-belonging. Not we need the enemy. So that's the basic structural difference is it possible to live without the other politically i don't think so no. no no i don't think so i think that you i think that you have to like i don't think you i think i think what you can recognize is that the enjoyment that you see in the other is actually your own and i think that's the key to me that's the real key political step and it actually underlies a lot of the things that we were talking about like the the can you take responsibility for your own way of enjoying, like for your own fantasy, for your own, like, and that I think is the real, is the real political question. It's very hard to dispel political fantasies though. You can it do it. Really you can is. even do it in front of people's faces and. It doesn't help. I know. They, well, I, know. They, I think they didn't, they find that actually you, people double down. I can't remember what they it's called. Down. There's a name right. for it. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah wow. no, that's absolutely right. James. Well, Todd, it's been. Uh, I think it's a good place to finish up. It's been. Uh, okay, great. It's been really fun. I'm yeah, forward... I love. I love chatting with you. Thanks. Uh, I look forward to your your two new releases, and hopefully you'll come on again to discuss uh, anytime them. you want. Anytime. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Take care, Todd McGann. Thanks very much. Thanks, James.